Good morning. Welcome back to the frozen tundra. Though well, today it's not particularly frozen, so. Um, for those of you that have not heard, Marge Covert passed away very early in the morning on Friday. Um, I was able to see her the, um, on Wednesday, talk to the family. Uh, visitation for her will be on Monday from 5 to 8 and then Tuesday from 12 until 1 at the LJ Griffin Funeral Home on Middle Belt Road between Warren and Ann Arbor Trail. The funeral will be at 1 o'clock on Tuesday at the funeral home and she will be buried at Mount Hope Memorial Gardens. This Thursday there will be a fundraiser for First, First Step sponsored by the AAUW. It will be held over at the Beer Garden on Michigan Avenue. Um, tickets are $20 for cash, $21 on a credit or debit, and food and drink will be available. There will be a 50-50 raffle and gift basket raffles and empowering women merchandise. Also this Saturday at 6 o'clock, we will be doing a murder mystery uh, event and potluck dinner. So dig out those church cookbooks you inherited from your grandmother and find some good recipe. Are there any other announcements? Yes. Yes. Okay, so Mother's Day tea on May 11th from 2 to 4 with tea and munchy desserts. Along with uh, raffles. And consistory will be next Sunday immediately following service. Because Jim and Alvina will be back by then. I have to look at my calendar. It's always a question. Anything else? All right, in that case, let us begin with our opening hymn. We praise thee, O God.
You may be seated. Please join in the call to worship. Turn to Christ. Place your trust in God. Lean into the Spirit. And now please join me in our prayer of invocation. God, in miracles and truth, bless us as we gather for worship with the power of your Holy Spirit. Reveal your presence in our midst and open our hearts and minds to receive your miracles of love. Strengthen our faith this day that we may go forth as witnesses of your miraculous love. Amen. Okay, since Nan's not here, we're not going to be having a moment with the kids. chapters 12, not verse 12 through 9. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though you, as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him, but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witness, witnesses and by faith in his name. His name itself may, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him his, this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I, now, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer, repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Now we're reading John 3, 1, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as pure he just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he has revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Our gospel reading is from the book of Luke. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. 
touch me for see, and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of God for the people of God. I had a sermon written, but it's not what you're going to hear today. Usually at work, I don't have time to keep up with what's going on out there because I'm busy doing what I got to do with my job. And yesterday was one of those days when things started out bad and didn't get really better. I had a building that was unlocked and entirely unoccupied. I had a stray dog coming in. I had, you know, all of my usual stuff I had to do. So keeping track of the news was not high on my agenda. And then I got a call from a friend of mine, and she was talking about something or other. And then she said, well, what do you think about Iran? And I'm like, I don't know. What do, I, what do you mean, what do I think about Iran? And she said, well, haven't you been watching the news? No. no. I've been a little busy here. I said, why, what's going on? And she said, oh, they fired like a whole bunch of missiles and drones into Israel. I'm like, great. <laughs> That's just fabulous. And I got to thinking about retribution and retaliation. And I was doing something else on the computer, and I happened to see a headline that says, man sentenced for shooting six-year-old in car. And I'm like, what? Why would you shoot a six-year-old? Apparently, it was in retaliation for the child's mother flipping this guy off in traffic one day. So he shot up the car and killed the six-year-old. He could have just as e easily gone, what a horrible person, and gone his merry way. Nobody would have thought twice about it. And oftentimes when people hurt us, we want to hurt back. Not because it's going to undo what they did, but somehow it makes us feel like we got something out of it, that we weren't just the victim. And yet, when we look at what Jesus taught, what he said was, if somebody slaps you on one side, turn your head and let them slap you on the other. Don't beat them up. Don't punch them back. If that's their thing, then that's their thing. And in many ways, that was a cultural reference because in the ancient Near East, the right hand was the clean hand, the left hand was the dirty hand. You didn't wipe yourself with your right hand, you always use your left. Um, and there's a very specific reference to if someone strikes you on the right cheek. Well, if you're facing someone, in order to strike them on the right cheek, you have to hit them with the left hand. But you always hit them with the palm of the hand, and it was open, you didn't punch them in order to strike them on the other cheek, you would either have to use your right hand, which is the clean hand, thus making it dirty, or you would have to hit them with the back of your hand, which again was 
not how things were done. So if someone hit you and you were like, fine, other side too, then they had to debase themselves to a degree in order to do that. And the other thing that Jesus said, if someone compels you to walk a mile, go the second mile. And in that case, it was a reference to the Roman army who could compel civilians to carry their pack for a mile, but only for a mile. Once the mile was up, either the soldier had to take the pack back or they had to find somebody else and make them do it. But if you went the second mile, then basically you were calling the soldier a weakling because he couldn't carry his own pack after a mile. And while we've lost those cultural references, I don't think we've lost the need to let some things go. World War I did not start because Archduke Ferdinand got shot. That may have been the final straw, but there was a whole lot of stuff going on prior to Ferdinand's assassination that fed into that. And there's a whole lot of other stuff that has fed into what's going on in the Middle East right now. And unfortunately, it seems that when retaliation occurs, whether it's at a personal level or whether it's at a national level, it always has to be one step up. And so you start out with an assassination and the next thing you know you have an entire world at war with each other because you shot our guy so now we're going to bomb your country oh well you bombed our country so now we're going to do this and pretty soon it just gets out of control um, but that's not what we're called to do we're called to love our enemy and boy, that is some tough, tough stuff. It is hard to care about somebody that wants to do you harm. It's just a tough, tough thing to do. I think about that a lot of times um, when people start talking about, you know, we need to kill all the gays. We need to, you know, put them all in prison somewhere. I'm like, <laughs> it is it is tough to hear that when it's directed at you. And then I think about all of those people who, while that doesn't affect them directly are willing to take up the cause and say, no, no, that's not how things get done. That's not right. It's not fair, and that's not how we're going to do it. In our Acts reading today, we heard Paul or Peter, who really didn't have a whole lot to say publicly while Jesus was engaged in his ministry. And yet, once Jesus had been crucified and resurrected and ascended, Peter became the voice, the voice box. He was the one who got out there in, in front of the crowds and spoke up. And he spoke not just to the common people, he fronted off the temple authorities and to some degree the Roman authorities, even though he knew how dangerous it was because he's one of those people. And that was not an easy place to be, to speak truth to power when it could very well have a very adverse effect on you. And yet again, I think we're called to do that. We are challenged to write our lawmakers, to call our city council people, 
to do what needs to be done so that they don't make decisions in a vacuum. If we don't say this is not the right thing to do, then they think, oh, well, nobody said no, so I guess it's okay. It's, it's, I think we all did this as a kid. We got an idea in our head, and because mom or dad had not specifically said we shouldn't do X, Y, or Z, we decided it was okay, even though we may have never asked, is it okay if I ride my bike down that big giant hill and jump over a ramp? Nobody said kids were smart, and yet somehow we've survived. But somehow those kind of things occur in levels of power. Well, I didn't get any calls that objected to my bill, so I'm just going to push it ahead. Well, that's because maybe we didn't know about your bill. Maybe you didn't tell us that you were putting something forward of that magnitude. And it's not easy to challenge those people. You know, we, we get raised up to acquiesce to p people in power. Um, so many times I've heard, particularly like with medical people, or someone is sick and in the hospital and the family, they don't have a medical background, so sometimes they just don't know what questions to ask. Or if they do ask a question and they get kind of pushed off to the side, they don't challenge it because that's someone who knows what's going on. They know what they're doing and we don't. And it's the same way in religion. Do we just trust that the person who's putting these things out because they have a big giant mega church and they've got lots of people listening to them that obviously they must know what they're talking about? That ain't necessarily so. We have seen people in high positions of authority in churches who fell very hard when things went wrong. I don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East. I don't have that gift. I don't know that I want that gift. Um, but I think that we as a nation would do well to not retaliate on behalf of our buddies and to encourage others to not retaliate on behalf of their buddies, no matter which side those buddies are on. There, I, I expect that in the days to come, there will be lots of blame going around. There will be lots of calls for retaliatory strikes. Um, and there may be some, some rumblings here in the US that we need to deal with those people. I honestly believe that if the German people had spoken up in the 1930s and said, yeah, that no, it's not right that you're taking all the Jewish businesses and you're shoving them off into a ghetto. That's not right. That while the Holocaust may have still happened, it wouldn't have been to the degree that it was. And there were, there were people who spoke up. Um, if you've ever heard the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a Catholic priest and theologian who spoke very openly in opposition to Adolf Hitler and his final solution. And the 
SS showed up at his door, troops showed up at his church, and he said, no, I'm not going to shut up because it's not right. Y'all need to stop doing what you're doing. This is not how Christ would have us do. And he continued to preach in opposition to Hitler, and eventually he was arrested and sent to a concentration camp and died there. He spoke truth to power, and yes, he paid for it. And I don't think that any of us are going to be in that situation, at least not before the next election. But I still think we need to stand up and take a stand and say, what you're doing is not appropriate. It's not right. I don't, you know, it's just wrong. Whether it's somebody in your family talking about we need to kick all of the Muslims out of the country, or whether it's someone speaking from the floor of Congress saying, you know, we need to go bomb the entire Middle East into nothingness. The opposition begins with us. And if we don't speak up, we may not get a second chance. Retribution is not what Jesus taught. Love your neighbor is what Jesus taught. Pray for your enemies. Forgive those who harm you. Every week when we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And I think we need to remember that those two are connected. We don't get to ask for forgiveness for our sins if we're not willing to forgive the sins of another. Or if you're a debtor or a trespasser person, any of those. If you're not willing to wipe out the harm of another, your harm doesn't get to be wiped out. They're connected. We are connected to each other regardless of what we look like, or how we worship, or what sacred scriptures we're reading. We are all connected together. And we need to remember that, that when harm is done to one, harm is done to the community. So take a minute, think about how you see the other. And then consider what kind of image you're putting out there for everyone else to see. Are you putting out the face of Christ? Are you offering up the hand of friendship? Are you forgiving as you want to be forgiven? Or are you reaching out to slap back when you get slapped? May your week be blessed. May you find peace in all your days. And may you find the courage to speak truth to power. Amen. join in our prayer of dedication. Thank you, God, for your many blessings to us. Accept now our tithes and offerings, and use us and our gifts for your kingdom. Amen. You may be seated.
Do I have any additional prayers and or con joys or concerns? Okay, I'm not sure if these are old ones or not. From Kelly, prayers for all moms and our church people. We love you. And all the crafters you met yesterday? Yes. All right. Hopefully we'll get to see a few of those crafters here. Lisa, Marilyn, and Caden? Um, prayers for their grandson, son, brother, who passed on March 15th. And we certainly want to remember Marge Covert's family as they bid Marge farewell this week. Um, certainly prayers for places of conflict in this, con in this world. Um, prayers for the leaders that Cool heads will prevail, even in moments of anger and pain. Prayers for Bobby, who apparently got tangled up with her dog's leash and did a face plant. Prayers that she will heal up quickly and will get back with us. Um, Nan texted me this morning and said that she woke up with vertigo, and that's why she is not here. So, prayers that she will be able to get past that. Yes? Prayers for Charlie, prayers for Charlie as he puts up with his lovely new jewelry back there. <laughs> and prayers for patience for Sarah because Charlie can't drive for a while or even ride in a car. Um, and prayers for me, I've been having some shoulder pain when I do certain things, and so my vet <coughs> sent me off, my vet, oh brother. <laughs> Wait till Dr. Baydoon finds out. My doctor sent me off for an ultrasound, and I have tendonitis in two of the four tendons that make up the rotator cuff, along with bursitis in my right shoulder. Fortunately, I do not have any tears, so there won't be surgery. But there will be PT while they try and reduce that inflammation. And if that doesn't help, then there may be some other more invasive things to deal with it. But hopefully that will fix it and I can go back to doing all those things I was doing without pain. On a positive note, the kittens are all getting huge. Um, three of the four are now over 800 grams, which is really big for their age. Um, my vet, I think, is kind of convinced I'm lying to her about when they were born. Because when I took them in at three weeks, they all had teeth. And she said, three-week-old kittens don't have teeth. Five-week-old kittens have teeth. I got a whole litter of overachievers. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so this week, we're working on getting them to eat kitten food as opposed to feeding off mom are getting a little big for that. So prayers that the kittens will continue to grow and be healthy. Um, and let's remember St. Paul's as we go through this time of transition. Um, it is not an easy thing to deal with, but we are tough and we will get through it. Anything else? All right, would you pray with me? Loving and eternal God, today we approach you with joys, 
with concerns, with our fears. We think of the family of Marge as they approach their final farewell. We pray that you will comfort them, that you will bring people to them who will offer them love and remembrances of her. We thank you for her life and for her time here at St. Paul's. And we pray that you will be with each one here as we remember March. Lord, for those who are hurting and healing, we pray your healing touch. We know that even with all the skills of the doctors, that your touch means far more. We pray that Charlie heals up from his surgery, that Bobby recovers from her fall. I pray that as I go forward with treatment for my shoulder that it will be beneficial. We remember Nancy and pray that the vertigo will leave her. Loving God, we thank you for all of the mothers here at St. Paul's. The ones who cared for us, who provided for us, who guided us. We ask your blessing on each and every one of them. Loving God, we pray that you will keep Jim and Alvina safe as they come home from Portugal, that they will be here with us soon. Lord, we pray for St. Paul's, the times they are a-changing. And change is often not an easy thing to deal with. We like things to be predictable. We like to know what's going to happen. And so as we move into this time of uncertainty, we pray that you will give us wisdom and guidance and peace of mind. That while we may not know the plan, you do. And we ask your guidance for that. God of peace, we pray your guiding hand on the many areas of conflict in our world. We pray that Those who would harm their neighbors are able to see you in them and understand that we are all formed by you. We know it's not easy to pray for our enemies. And yet many times as we pray for our enemies, those prayers make us see them not so much as enemies, but as brothers and sisters.
Gracious God, give us wisdom so that we don't see those about us as the other, but as us. We pray for our leaders, for those in positions of power, that they will exhibit your love and your patience. And now, loving God, hear the silent prayers of your people, prayers that live so deep we cannot give them voice. Gracious God, when your son walked the earth, his disciples said, teach us to pray. And now we offer that same prayer to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now let us join in our communion hymn number 123, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
may be seated. Passover is a time of remembrance for the Jewish people. They remember the days when they were slaves, when they could not gather freely. and of their release from bondage. And each year it is celebrated in Jewish homes and synagogues around the world. And oftentimes it is a community event. Large dinners are held where you invite people into your home. There's all this food. And on the last night, before he was betrayed. Jesus participated in one of those dinners. He sat with his friends, he sat with his followers, and he sat with the one who would betray him. I'm sure what many people would call an enemy. And during that meal, he took one of the pieces of bread and he broke it, and he handed it to him, and he said, take and eat all of you. Nobody skips this. This is my body, which will be broken for each and every one of you. And then at the end of the meal, he took the final cup, and again, he blessed it, and he passed it among them, and he said, take and drink, each of you, for this is my blood, which will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, do this and remember me. And so today we remember. We remember the sacrifice. We remember the celebration. We remember the joy of the resurrection. And remembering, I offer you the cup and the bread. Now join me, if you would, in our final hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. It's a hymn that always makes me think of Sunday school when I sing it. That's where I learned it.
are witness of God's love. You are witness of Christ's life. You are witness of the Holy Spirit. Go forth as witnesses of the blessing of our God. Now let us join together for let there be peace on earth. Come on, Sarah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. That was an excellent sermon. Excellent. And it's too bad you couldn't be standing in front of our Congress and giving.